Hello, Grizzlies, and welcome back to another episode of Grizzly True Crime. My name is Gisela Kay, and today we are joined by criminal profiler, psychotherapist, addiction specialist, and author, John Kelly. So let's welcome John Kelly back to the show. Welcome. Welcome. Hi, Grizzlies. Hope everybody's well. Thank you so much. I'm so honored to be back. Just can't thank you enough for your uh, great, great, great group you have there. I mean, it's uh, it's my favorite station. We have to get into the eating disorder, okay? Yeah, yeah. And the child, the childhood eating disorder, lots of times that kind of overeating, which put the weight on them, comes from stress, can be genetics, but usually stress is involved. Usually anger, usually anger. I'm too. I mean, there's a lot of people with eating disorders. And, and I'll raise my hand. I was a fat kid in school. I, I will raise my hand and say that, you know, feeling angry, feeling upset, you know, definitely has a lot to do with the eating disorder and, and vice versa. The more you eat, the angrier you get at yourself, but the angrier you get at yourself, the more you eat. And like many people have said, many professionals have said, it's not what you're eating as much as what's eating you, okay? (laughs) So so you get into this situation where, you know, you have this self-hatred and, you know, you're tensed up and you're angry and you can't take it out or you don't want to take it out and you people abusing you or girls throwing stuff at you or guys making fun of you or beating you up or whatever. and you have no outlet, so you, you've got to soothe it. See, anger anger at some point becomes so toxic in you, in your system. You look, you're always looking for ways to soothe it, okay? It can be food, can be drugs, can be sex. Um, you know, uh, a lot of people do it in a, you know, deal with their stress and anger in a smart way through exercise. But... There's got to be some way your body, you know, sends out like uh, a distress signal. I need something soothing. Something has to soothe this. Okay. Mm -hmm. And he's no different. I think the food really, really was very soothing to him. Now, the question I have is, did the food move towards the heroin? Because this is what I'm thinking in my mind. Yeah. Yeah. Then the boxing came after he got into recovery from the heroin because I can't see him, yeah. you know, um, doing the boxing and the heroin. I mean, it'd be, you know, almost impossible, you know, two yeah, totally yeah. different uh, lives. So how but you- the rage that is underlying whoever this person was is extremely obvious. Yes. I mean, to walk into a house with a knife. Mm-hmm. To stab people to death, okay, in a frenzy, because he was in whoever did it was in and out of there pretty quickly. Okay. Yep. yep. We're talking about a frenzy, okay, a blood letting, bloodlust frenzy. So the question, the question is, how much anger and adrenaline is running at that point in time? Okay. Yes. This guy isn't a happy camper at that point in time. I mean, he's not hes not neutralized in any which way, shape, or form. This guy is a, you know, really, really uh, live wire that is just exploding. It's, it's just, yeah. uh, it's like 20 years of rage or something coming up, right. you yeah. know, at that moment. So... You know, the question is, what's he angry at? Right? I mean, that's our question, right? What's the motive here? What's what's he angry at? Yeah. And I think that's something we have to really look at. I mean, we have to look at, you know, what 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 is at the bottom of creating all this rage? Mm-hmm. But rejection in any way to him is another form of abandonment. And we can, this is so primitive, we can go all the way back with him now 
from Pullman to being in school when people were abusing him or making fun of him or humiliating him, that is and re rejecting him. That is all rejection. And, you know, it's like we don't want nothing to do with you. You know, you're not with us. We're abandoning you, you know. That may have even played a role. Now, that's, that's how my brain works. May have even played a role why he wouldn't get together. And we need to talk about this, too. Well, he's been slapped in the face, if you will, by the chief. He did not get the job. Two girls got the job before him. He has this relationship with the Pullman law enforcement. He has a white Elantra. They've got an all points bulletin out for white Elantra. He's going to have a career for the rest of his life dealing with law enforcement in some way or teaching it through criminology. And he d doesn't even have the common respect to get in touch with Pullman and say, look, it, I have a white Elantra, but you don't have to worry about me and come over now if you need to do anything. I just want to save you guys a lot of time so you don't have to eliminate me. You can come over now and check the car out. I mean, I got I have a white Elantra, you know, or call them up or something, you know, and, uh, you know, because, because, I mean, he's supposed to have this nice relationship with the chief after the letter he wrote. Yeah. Uh, wanted to do an internship with them. Obviously wanted a job, a tech job, right? With this, uh, with them. Yes. And now they're looking for a white Elantra. Uh, he's right in, you know, the zone of, uh, of people of interest at the time with a white Elantra. And um, he doesn't even have, you know, the common decency the reasonable person would have to go over and say to his future colleagues, which would be law enforcement, that, hey, I have uh, a white Elantra. You guys want to check it out right now and just make sure whatever you want to do with it. But I just want to own up. I mean, how is he going to answer that in court is what I'm wondering if he's yes. asked that question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because a reasonable person, you know, who wants a, a career in criminology. Yes. Would uh, get in touch with, you know, the law enforcement right next door that he's had a relationship with and say, hey, guys, you know, uh, I mean, it's just the right thing to do. It is just the right thing to do. Yes. So I don't know how he's going to answer that one if it's posted. In dealing with um, families, uh, thousands of families over the years, the mother usually is as happy as the saddest child. Usually the mother will migrate towards the saddest child or the child that they feel needs the most attention. Mm -hmm. Now, that's interesting to me because in our research of many, many heroin addicts, we have found that lots of times, not all the time, but lots of times, between a mother and son, there is usually a symbiotic relationship that's created. The mother sees the child suffering with this low-grade depression or this self-hatred. Um, I wouldn't, you know, or 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 this uh, this uh, inferiority or inadequacy or whatever and becomes attached at the hip and becomes more of an enabler 
So then as the child gets older and if the child migrates into heroin, lots of times his, the child's biggest enabler will be yeah. the mother. And the mother will really um, go out of her way, um, you know, to care for this this child. And um, unfortunately, without the proper education, even though they're showing their love um, in an enabling way, it is a it can also be in a uh, destructive yes. way. Yes, this is a question that came up earlier as well from someone. So it's coupled with Loretta's question of, do you think he was back on drugs or back on a substance to be able to do this? Well, that, you know, I looked at that and that's a great question, Loretta. And I thought about that. And um, I, you know, uh, if you're on heroin, heroin's going to incapacitate you. Heroin is a very strong central nervous system depressant. Okay. Yeah. It's going to... You're just going to want to sit there when you when you're, you know, um, on your dose of heroin. You're going to you're pretty much going to just hang out and nod out. Okay, you're going to go into la la land and sedate yourself. You are definitely not going to be uh, hyped up and running, flying through a house with a knife. Okay, I mean that's why very rarely you'll find. Sexual predators. I mean, it's extremely rare to find a sexual predator that whose drug of choice is heroin. Their drug of choice may be methamphetamine, which is a sexual stimulant, or cocaine, which is a se sexual stimulant. But stimulants, just the same central nervous system stimulants, that are going to give them the energy and hop them up, hype them up to get out there and get on the hunt and stalk and you know, uh, and, and uh, you know, track their victim down. People on heroin are incapacitated by the heroin. It's such a strong central nervous system depressant, and they're just they're just they're just going to lay down or sit down somewhere. They're not they're not going to be out running around trying to chase somebody down. So, th so I got to believe that he was in that house, and he was just um, really out of it. You know, um, not on any, not on any heroin. He definitely wasn't on heroin. Could it have been a Ted Bundy kind of thing where he had a few pops? Mm -hmm. That's what I'm, I forgot about that. Remember that, that brewery that said that as soon as he had like two or three beers, then suddenly he'd be calling woman a bitch and he'd be like literally like really degrading woman and getting angry until they had to say, listen, <laughs> Like, could you just behave tonight? And then he was shocked. Like, what do you mean? I think you've got the wrong person. And he never came back. But there actually was a bit of an alcohol. I'm not saying he's an alcoholic, but a little bit of an alcohol red flag, shall we say, in the, the, the anger coming out in him when he drinks a little bit more. Yeah. Well, absolutely. I mean, alcohol is a uh, central, central nervous system depressant too, but it's not as strong as heroin. So it'll just... Uh, uninhibit you, you know, to a certain point. So he has this underlying anger and he has two or three drinks and now he's calling women a bitch at the bar. <laughs> you know, before he has the drinks, he's not calling any woman <laughs> right. a bitch or anything derogatory. And now, you know, he's going to let them all have it, you know. Yep. After the second or third drink, this guy's ready to roll. Yeah. So I, um, someone is saying alcohol and roids most deaf. I mean, it could have been on steroids for all we know. No question about it. Roid rage. I mean, uh, mm. I could yeah. see that. I mean, uh, I think one of one, one thing I, I, when I heard about this case, uh, I, I was talking to Frank, but I said, boy, it looks like we've got a killer on steroids here. You know, uh, I, you know, now it's just, a saying because again, to fly through a house with a knife stabbing away, that takes a lot of energy. You got to be moving. It takes a lot of guts to go through that window or door, or whatever slide door you went through. Um, and again, a couple of pops might give you that extra little courage you need. I mean, I don't know. 
But whoever went into that house, yeah, whether it was uh, chemically induced confidence or whatever, had confidence in themselves that they were going in there to take care of business. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of mistakes, a lot of mistakes all over the place. I think um, being in a rage, um, maybe even to the point of uh, disassociating, um, being in a disassociated state. Yeah. Um, I think I think being under uh, the influence of something. Uh, you know, roids or probably more like, uh, you know, an alcohol, a few pops, alcohol or something. I mean, uh, but obviously there were uh, mistakes made. Um, you can see a certain amount of planning. Uh, as I said in the beginning, I felt this person stalked and, um, you know, uh, voyeured these people and, was always watching, you know, uh, had his eye on them, um, followed them probably on Facebook and everything. So you see a certain amount of um, organization. But then, I mean, again, you got to be a moron to run into a, a house filled with people with a knife and expect not to you know, leave uh, any evidence. I mean, all they need is a hair. Yeah. All you're going to do is drop a hair. All you're going to do is touch something. Forget about that. Yeah, because, you know, with various, a pickerism is using a sharp object to get sad, to get sexual satisfaction of piercing usually a female's body. Okay, so these pickerists um, look at their sharp instrument, usually their knife, as a phallic symbol that is, um, you know, um, just something they believe uh, is like a penis to them and that they are going to plunge it into the woman mm -hmm. and that's where the um you know orgasmic uh feeling of stabbing comes in uh and this is the sexual this whole sexual component of pickerism is the penetrating of uh usually a female with the uh sharp uh, object, the sharp object. And usually the prickerist will focus on stabbing the woman in the upper breast, uh, the buttocks, or the groin area. Okay. So, and we don't know all of those details in this case either. So, no, the thing that jumped out at me and why we even, why I went towards prickerism. Is because I didn't hear anything about cutting. I only heard about stabbing. Yes. And my colleague said, nah, 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 let's not, you know, so that's why we really didn't do a show. Yes. On Icarism, nor did we do a show uh, on Delphi with, uh, with Icarism, but that one, there was a more of an excuse not to do uh, uh, and do a show or, or focus on a picaristic angle. But mm -hmm. with this, with this case and the way these poor victims were murdered with this stabbing, um, I, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I, it would pro it would be the first mass murder I know of with the pickerism angle. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Bundy was in a pickerist. Um, Annie Rowling, I don't think was a pickerist. Um, Richard Speck. 
<laughs> Possibly. You know? Um, but usually you don't see people doing mass murders with knives. I'm sure right? I'm Yes, there's a forensic psychologist that actually said that this suspect's profile is more like a mass murderer with a knife instead of a gun rather than a serial killer, which is what these other ones are. Maybe he was a budding serial killer, but maybe he's more like that. And you know a lot about that, too. Like maybe his thinking could be, I know people, we <laughs> speculate sometimes, could he be an incel or something like that? But could he be? that type of psychology of a mass murderer, just, you know, one-upping everyone again, you know, <laughs> with a knife. Well, he, at, th at this point, uh, it, he's absolutely right. I mean, it's just a, a mass murder with a knife, right? Now, will he go on to kill others and become a serial killer like Bundy and Danny Rowling? Yeah. Um, you know, um, it's got a good head start if he's not already, right? We don't know if he's killed before or not. And then again, could it be pickerism or is it not pickerism at all? Is the reason he used the knife because it is quieter? Yeah, could be. Maybe, probably. maybe, maybe, maybe it has nothing to do yeah. with sex. Maybe it only has to do with rage and he wanted to kill these girls and it was quieter than a gun. Yeah. I Possibly. don't believe that. I mean, that that's down, <laughs> that's second or third down the line. But, but I don't know, you know, what he's thinking. He's the criminologist. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> or poor excuse for a criminologist. All right. Quickly first. So Sonny's daughter is a federal law enforcement SME, a litigation consultant, a crimes against a person expert, a crime media commentator, a TEDx talk speaker, a CEO, and so much more. So Sunny's been with us before. If you missed that episode, please check it out. She's also got a YouTube channel. All the links uh, to find Sunny are in the description box, and I will pin it in the comments for you afterwards as well. So without further ado, let's welcome Sunny to the show. <laughs> hey, Grizzly Nation, rise <laughs> up. How you guys doing? <laughs> They're I'm, all so excited to see you. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to see everyone. I am at another location this time, so everything looks different. And you guys, hello, Sandra. Thank you. How you doing? <laughs> it's so good. Hey, Bobby. Love you, too. <laughs> we got a lot to do today. Oh, look, you guys have my heart. Well, listen, we're going to get into it today. G's got us rolling. And you guys might not like some of what I have to say, but you know, I love you anyway. I'm going to be honest. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, I know we, we are focused very much on the victims, but I also want to bring our lens back to the criminal justice system and how it is very important, like Ann Taylor said, that everyone have the opportunity to justice because we don't want someone going to prison. And there are plenty of people currently in prison who are not guilty of the crimes that they have been accused of because they didn't have proper counsel and um, their counsel wasn't able to mount a defense. And it is, even though we might not like um, it when it seems like it impacts us. But don't forget the justice system is supposed to be balanced. So we have to have people that represent those who are accused. And we also want them to have the best defense. So if they are guilty, then they are not able to get out because they can't say uh, what a lot of people have claimed before, ineffective counsel. And um, I do remember uh, Ann Taylor is j not just a public defender, she is someone in that community. She, that is where she's from. That is where her and her family reside. She went to, the, this is her alma mater, but she is really doing her job. So while we might not like it that she's defending him, if we were in trouble, if we were in need, if someone in our family, we don't want them to have shoddy counsel. We want them to have very good counsel. So we know that they are getting the defense that they need to address the charges. And I just think we we need to, everybody, if we could slow it down, this is a very emotional time. And um, 
you know, we all want every, we want the best for the families and at all exactly. costs and for the victims. Exactly. And of course, Brian Koberger, you guys just, I always remind everyone is innocent till proven guilty in a court of law. And we do want him to have a fair trial. And I mean, I'm assuming that having the chief public defender, he's, he's got the best public defender. Would that be fair to say? Well, yeah, he has one of the best in that office and often because uh, a very, because she is the chief public defender, but, um, and she is also death penalty certified. Now, even though we don't know until later whether this will become a death penalty case, you don't want the death penalty attorney coming in after the fact. You want them on the case from the very beginning so that they're not having to get up to speed. And most often in high profile cases like this, the person that leads the office will take the mantle of the case and build a team around them. And I'll talk about what we need to talk about later really? on this, but <laughs> you let, let's let's give G a round of applause because <laughs> let me tell you, she's got to be the best that there ever was at. Uh, you know, you make a sharp private investigator. <laughs> Thank you yes. so much. Okay, Great. so now we get into what we've been diving out for you. Mm -hmm. So Zena Kernodal's mom, Cara Northington, is how she's done, but it's Cara Kernodal on the court system. She was arrested on November 19th, 2022, six days after the murders and charged with two felony counts of possession of a controlled substance. She's actually listed on the Kootenai County Sheriff's Office as an active wanted person. She's been working with Ann Taylor since 2017 and when I say working with, but you know, Ann Taylor's defended her a few times. We're going to get into that. Her August 2017 misdemeanor charges have been adjudicated. What yes. Yes. So I think she's, from what I could gather, I could see at least twice that she's worked with Zana Kernodal's mom, but it's not like mm -hmm. 2017 all the way up until January 5th, the end, you know, it's, it's, it's on, an, it's just a few cases and she's got at least 40 other cases yeah. that she's had similar because, you know, she's, she suffers from substance abuse disorder, you know, right. so uh, she's got, she's a, a repeat offender in that way. So yeah. many attorneys have actually defended her. So we've got to look at that as well, the whole history. If you can check it out on the court system, anyone can access it. If I can from the Netherlands, you know you can. <laughs> okay, I'll link it below afterwards. So um, Anne was assigned to her case on November 21st, 2022. And then now, she... Yes. Now that may have happened because she was the last attorney listed on the case prior to. It does not mean that they met. And yes. it does not mean that um that they had any engagement necessarily but she may have been the last attorney on this and then you know subsequently she was listed again if that nice. makes sense to there there's a whole process to the criminal justice system and while we think everything goes fast it goes just like this sometimes the paperwork doesn't catch up so ann taylor withdrew from her case officially on January 5th, 2023, and then was assigned to Brian Koberger's case as his defense attorney. She mm -hmm. signed a substitution of counsel and then passed the case on to another attorney. Any right. thoughts about that? Yes. So uh, the substitution, substitution and passing it on to another counsel um, may have been, I think she did that and it was outside of their office. I don't think she's got a public defender any longer. But, but it is to take the case. And remember that Ann Taylor is the chief. So her name is going to be on everything anyway. Okay. She's going to yes. have to sign on to all of those things. And I want to go back to something else that you said, G, earlier about um, her having a mom having a substance abuse problem. So one of the things that I've also done in the past, I was the co-chair of the National Caucus, uh, um, the National Opioid Caucus for the United States here. And um, opioids of any kind and drug use, we have to remember that that is such uh, people that have drug abuse and use and abuse issues tend to get tangled up is the word I'm going to use in the criminal justice system in a way that is very difficult to become untangled from because they cannot find themselves. Uh, they, it's hard for them to get 
sometimes the services and support that they need, but also the mental and emotional stability to get off drugs. So this seems like a mom who was having a lot of trouble over the course of her lifetime, which still exists, and that her daughter was her daughter. But when you are a person who is addicted to drugs, the drugs take over your capacity to parent. Yeah. So Zana was probably without her parenting, not without her love maybe, but her ability to parent in a way that was important to her. So because she didn't have the funds, she would have been someone in the public defender's office quite a long time, probably even yes. before Ann Taylor got there. So mind you, there are more than there's more than one attorney in the public defender's office, but because this is such a high profile case, having to remove the case completely from the public defender's office is what they likely is what they did to kind yeah. of separate. Okay. So the substitution of counsel would have been to remove her case out altogether, which is what should have been done. That makes sense, actually. Yes. I, I know I you all probably don't want to hear that, but you know, <laughs> we got to stay focused on the main thing. The main thing is Zana's mom, even when she's talking on camera and she's talking to to um, the media, we don't know what her capacity is when she's doing that, right? Yeah. We don't yes. know what her frame of mind is. Uh, and it is easy. And as somebody who is also a human trafficking and exploitation expert, people can get easily exploited and the words distorted when you are talking about, this is emotional for her, drugs or no okay, drugs. So let's see, there is okay. a new attorney assigned, Christopher David Schwartz, and Ann Taylor is listed as inactive in Cara's cases. She's right. listed in, yeah. That's, that's just normal. It's not like inactive is like, ooh, inactive in her case, it's what happens in every case. When Yeah, it, it, it's what happens assigned. in every case. It, it's, it's, not, it's nothing new at all. Yes. Yeah, and so we got to stop these conspiracy theories. Yeah, because that's not, it's not helpful for us as the public. And it yeah. is not helpful for the families. And, and, and it's really not helpful for the victims' memories. And Erica, exactly. I get what you're saying, that you're concerned that this will be grounds for appeal. Well, remember, there's a very, uh, there's a judge that is sitting on this. There are a lot of things that we we're going on remember all of the information has stopped right now right so we're there's speculation around when people see this and find out something else so um the appeal that you're talking about would be for ineffective counsel right or for the conflict of interest however the judge is also overseeing all of this all of the paperwork, all of the process. And if the judge also thought that there was a problem with this case, then the judge would have a duty to address it as well, right? So when you when you think about, um, don't think we're gonna get all the way down the line and, and say, oh my gosh, uh, now that now they're just finding out this. If we know about it, they're hearing all the chatter too. <laughs> oh no! And uh, Blockello said the judge would address it before the trial starts. Yes, yes. So there are a lot of things. That the judge is not going to. The case is one too important, but there is a process in the courtroom too that um, yes. you cannot get. The judge does not want any of this foolishness. Judges don't like foolishness in their courtrooms. And this is a high profile case where everyone is looking at it. Yes. Now, the judge has discretion though, but I just, I don't see that. I don't see this on the, on the outside. Yes, could it be a problem? But I just don't see this being uh, something that will get 
anything dismissed, lessened, or anything like that. So Madison Mogan's dad, Benjamin Mogan, was represented by Ann Taylor in 2020. It was in September of 2020 for possession of marijuana. And in April as well of 2020. Sorry, it's not like chronological there, but uh, possession of marijuana. And so out of 23 cases, some are just, you know, an infraction, not wearing seatbelt, things like that. She represented him in two, and the cases are closed. And mm -hmm. then... Maddie's stepmom, Corey Hatrock, was represented by Ann Taylor in 2022. That was in June of 2022 for the same thing, possession of marijuana. And then I just put the little blurb there below that they say of that code and Idaho state, the definition of what this charge is. Is this, now with everything that we've looked at, and if you're joining later, I hope you'll watch the replay or just go back a bit and catch up at 1.5 speed with everything we've looked at with the other family members. Instead of hyping it up, we're trying to diffuse it just a little bit and look at it from a legal aspect and logic as much as emotions. I understand that, right? But is this a conflict of interest? And does it risk a mistrial? I, I believe that the conflict of interest on the surface exists but I believe that it has been dealt with. And if it hasn't, I believe the judge will deal with it. Um, this case is like all cases is too important, but this one is too high profile for it to be something that the judge is not dealing with. I would just want to say again, that everyone must remember, we are talking about this case as we are getting information that is secondhand and third hand, because those that know cannot speak. They legally cannot say anything. So yes. we won't know. We don't know until we know. Exactly. And is it considered unethical? Oh, no, I'm sorry, G. You oh, yeah. Uh, firstly, if Ann learned, if Ann Taylor learned information about Zena while working with Cara, could there be a chance that the circumstances of the crime come into question. Ann Taylor, the public defender for mom, would not disclose. I, I can, I just have no reason to believe that this attorney, public defender, chief public defender, um, would have any reason to disclose anything about a former client to the current client, even though the former client's daughter was murdered. If that means, you see how convoluted that sounds? No, I don't think that, I think that question is a no. This will remain, I know. So if you could one more time, what about Taylor representing two other parents? There's actually three other parents. It's Zana's mom and Maddie's dad yeah. and stepmom so in the I past. So I believe that they, that the office, the public defender's office was removed from all of their cases. I'm not 100% sure, but the office would not likely represent their cases at all. And I think I read something where they were getting private, where their cases were switched over to private attorneys or another public defender's office. Remember, <laughs> she's the chief public defender. Her colleagues do not want her doing anything that will disrupt and dismantle the reputation of their office because they've got a lot more clients while she's got the eye and the light on this remember they're still defending others yes yeah okay so thank you so much grizzlies if you want to find uh sunny slaughter on facebook twitter linkedin or youtube everything is linked in the description box and I will link it afterwards in the pinned comments. Probably tomorrow, because Sunny told me I must go to bed now. Yes, <laughs> night, so night. Probably, I'll probably do that tomorrow, yeah. So <laughs> thank you so much uh, again for being here with us. Thank I you. I really appreciate it. And Grizzly, we'll see Sunny again back soon. And Sunny will be on Law & Crime Network on Monday. So we'll see when that airs as well. And we will see you. I'll see you in the next one, you guys. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, <Take care>. bye. <laughs> bye.